Uh, guys, welcome to our online service this morning. Good morning, my name's Lindsay So. I lead our women's ministry here at TBC. And today I have the pleasure of reading the Bible. If you don't have a Bible and would like one, we have some up the back of the church. They're our gift to you. Could you please turn your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1, verses 24, and we're reading to 2, chapter 2, verse 5. Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become a servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of the mystery which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ is powerfully works in me. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and those of Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches to complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith is in Christ. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful to be here. Have your Bibles open in front of you. You're going to need it so that you can follow along as we open up and continue our sermon series in the book of Colossians. As, we, as we've got a, a bit longer to go through it, um, we've been captivated. It's called Captivated as we're captivated by Jesus and how it shapes our life. Um, next Sunday, we've got a guest preacher coming, um, a lecturer who actually has written commentaries on the book of Colossians, who's really someone who's spent... I suppose, years in the book, and he's going to come and he's going to open up God's Word for us next Sunday morning and Sunday night. So please encourage you, make sure you're back here next Sunday as we continue our series in the book of Colossians. And let's, let's ask God now to help us. Because I don't know about you, but the reason you know, I do like writing books is because the, 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 person who speaks, the, the person who speaks to you the most in everyday life is you. The loudest voice you hear every day is you talking to yourself. And so when you read books, you have a chance for someone else to speak to you. But now we have a chance to sit 
And we actually really want God to speak to us. And so let's ask him to help us with that now. Heavenly Father, we yearn to know you better. And so, Father, give us hearts that are soft and ready to hear what we need to hear. May we see it. May we hear it. May we understand it. And Lord, we pray this not for our our fame, but actually we pray it for the sake of your kingdom and for the glory of your Son. And so, Father, help us now. May your Spirit be at work helping us understand who we are as people of God saved through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What is the one thing that you're willing to put everything on the line for? What is that one thing in which you will sacrifice everything for, for that goal or that ambition to take place? What is that one thing? What's that one thing that you'll put everything on the line for? You know, maybe you're a young married couple and, and right now the one thing that you're putting everything on the line for is a, a deposit for a house. And so th- that, that ambition, it really, it does cost you because you're not going to eat out as much. You're going to have baked beans two nights a week. You're not going to go with your friends. You're doing all that you can do. You work long hours. You scrimp hard just so that one ambition of buying a home can happen. And so that's the one thing that you'll put everything on the line for. Maybe you're a parent. And, and that one thing is your child at school, justice. You know, that one thing that you'll put everything to the side for is for the sake of your child and where they're going to be, how they're going to perform. When something doesn't go right, you're the first one at the principal's office standing up for the justice of your child. The, the one thing that you'll put everything on the line for. What might it be for you? I, I don't know what it is. But what's that one thing that you'll do anything for? You know, Alex Holland, Hol- Holnold, um, I-, I was watching him on Disney, P- Disney Plus. I was watching the-, the-, the movie Free Solo, which is a documentary about this, this young man who was climbing. He- his ambition was to climb Yosemite, El, Cap- El Catan. He was going to climb it. It's a thousand meters in height. And he's going to climb it, be the first person to climb it without ropes. That was the one thing. It was his ambition. And as you watch the documentary, you see that that ambition and that goal, he would sacrifice everything for that to take place. You even saw the way in which he sort of pushed his girlfriend to the side. The way that he he worried his mum. And and, and the way that he would sacrifice blisters and blood and bruises in practicing and getting it right so that he could be the first person to climb, climb this wall. In fact, he even, they even asked him, are you worried about dying and what it will affect your family? And he says, I'm not really worried about that, but I've got one thing in mind. Now, Alex is a unique individual. He's not like us in the sense that we probably don't have, he has no fear of heights, whereas you and me probably wouldn't do what he did. But what's that one thing that you'll, put on, that you'll give up everything and you'll put it on the line for? What's that one thing that you'll do in life? I don't know about you, but I... When I get to the end of my life, whether that's 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years, whatever that might be, I don't know about you, but I don't know how I would feel if I look back in those last couple of weeks or on my deathbed and I look back and I realize that the one thing that I live for and put everything on the line for really wasn't the right thing to do. To look back and go, I made a mistake, I was living and put everything on the line for that wrong thing. How would you feel if you look back on your life and you you think, man, I did that? See, I I reckon today's passage, it's one of those passages that gives us just really great clarity. It gives us great clarity today so that you can have great conviction for tomorrow. So that when we get to the end of our life, whenever that may be, we can look back and go, actually, you know, we we did contend for the right things. We don't look back and go, man, I contended for the wrong thing here when I should have been contending for that. And I reckon this is a passage that gives us clarity today as a church so that we can have great conviction tomorrow so that we don't do the wrong things. So this is a passage that gives us incredible clarity about what we are here to do. Because the reality is tomorrow someone will come along who possibly could have a better ministry and say, here's how you should do gospel ministry a different philosophy, or they come in and they say, hey, we've got a different Jesus than what the book of Colossians has. There'll be this temptation in a year, two years, three years, as you're in the trenches, 
as you serve alongside each other, as you do things week in, week out, as you serve on teams, you'll think, is it really worth it? All this energy, the tiredness that comes along with it. Do I really want to be serving on a team next Sunday? Surely it'll be easier to just give that up and pursue something else. Because I think this passage, it gives us great clarity today so that you can have great conviction for tomorrow. See, Paul, he's writing this letter to the city in Colossae. He's writing to a city that the gospel's come to, they've received it. He's seen the fruit of that ministry. He's writing to them probably about 60 AD. He's probably writing from Rome in chains. And he's writing to them to say, hey, you've received the gospel, keep walking in the gospel. Just as you received the gospel, keep looking to Jesus. He's writing to them because in a way, there's a sense in which false teachers have maybe sort of come into this church and they're giving a different Jesus. They're saying, we've got a mystery for you to have that that you haven't got. They may have ever been pressing in saying, hey, we've got a different ministry practice that you should try because it's going to be better. And Paul writes into that. And so Paul, who's been motivated by the gospel, he's a servant of Jesus. We've seen that from last week. Today, we're going to sort of see his template for ministry. We're going to see his structure, what he's passionate about, what he's contending for. Because great clarity today will give you great conviction for tomorrow. What's that one thing that you'll you'll put everything on the line for? So this passage, it's, I I actually think it's a passage that's about what he's contending for. What he's willing to go tired over. What he's willing to have sleepless nights over. He's he's contending strenuously for them. Now, what I want you to sh- I want to show you how I think that's the main point of this passage. That he's strenuously contending. He's he's striving. Now, look at verse twenty four. Grab your Bible. It says, "I rejoice in my suffering, in what I'm suffering for you." Then you go down to verse five, and it says, "I present with you in spirit and." delight. Now that word delight is exactly the same Greek word as rejoice in verse 24. Now 24 to 5, it's like a bookend. You know in the bookcase you have bookends that hold your books together and the important stuff's in the middle. See what it's saying is he is rejoicing on each end and what's right in the center of this passage is verse 29 and verse 1. And have a look what's at the middle of it. I strenuously contend. Verse 1, I want you to know how I am contending. Basically, what I think Paul's saying is, I'm putting it on the line for you. I'm putting it on for you guys. I'm strenuously contending for you. And I think that's really even what he's saying in verse 24. I rejoice in what I'm suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions. Why? For the sake of his body, which is the church. Now, here's what Paul's not saying. Some people will say Paul's saying here in this moment that that filling up of Christ's afflictions is that Christ's sacrifice wasn't enough. That there is something that you and me have to add to the finished work of Christ on the cross. That's not what Paul's meaning. He's not saying that, that Christ's, that, that what he accomplished at the cross, we have to add to, to be saved. No, no. What he's, what, here's what I think he's saying in a moment. Because the context tells us from last week that that's not the case. Verse 20, verse 22 of chapter 1 tells us that Christ's sacrifice was sufficient. Jesus on the cross shouted out, it is finished. There's nothing else to be done. And so it can't be Paul saying we need to do more to gain God's salvation, to gain his acceptance, to please God. No, no, it's all done. It's finished. So what's Paul saying? Here's what I think he's sort of saying. It's a bit difficult. It's, he's saying, I'm willing, I'm rejoicing in the little bit that I'm suffering because I'm suffering and really I'm suffering for Christ. Do, do you know, like it was in Acts, you know when Jesus said to Paul, 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 why are you persecuting me? And you think, but hang on, Paul's persecuting the church, not Jesus. But Jesus is saying, I'm so united to the church that when you persecute the church, you're persecuting Jesus. That when Paul suffers, Christ is suffering. In another way, I think what it's saying is that, you know, I will, when my kids are sick, if my wife is hurt, you know, I would rather take it from them. I'd rather jump in front of the bus than have them be hit by a bus. And I think what Paul's saying is, hey, you know what? I'm willing to suffer a little bit for you guys because of how much Christ suffered for you. 
I'm going to suffer a little bit because my Saviour suffered a lot. Now, these words are jolting. I, I, I find that they, that, that they confront us because we live in 21st century Western Sydney where, where suffering is something that's seen that you have to do away with. You have to get rid of it as quick as possible. We live in a mindset where, where we are the, the highest thing for life is comfort, financial security, well-being, and your health. A mindset that rejoices in our blessings of our financial security having a good time and living as an individual how I ever want to live. But you see, Paul doesn't, Paul doesn't go looking for suffering. He doesn't push it away. But he also isn't someone who's disgruntled and bitter about it. He actually just sees that he's willing to suffer a little bit because his Savior suffered a lot. He's willing to, to play his part in suffering because that's just a part and parcel of what it is until Christ returns. And check out what he's putting it on the line for in verse 29. See? He's, he's putting it on. How do we know he's putting it on the line? Because he's strenuously contending. It's a, it's a word called toil. He's, he's going physically tired. It's physically and emotionally draining. I don't know what he would have looked like. I imagine what Paul would have looked like after so many years of ministry of being beaten and bruised and, and all that. What would he have looked like? But, but it's a sense, it's saying, hey, I, I'm just, I'm toiling for you guys. And what's he doing that for? What's he putting it on the line for? Is he putting it on the line for some incredible, well-gifted marriages? Is he putting it all on the line so that you can have the ideal job? Is he, is he putting it all on the line so that you can build your ego and have your identity surrounding around you through ministry at church? Is he, is he putting it on the line so that you can have your egos and, and your goals and aspirations on an individual level met? No, he's actually putting it on the line for their maturity. Great clarity today so that we can have great conviction for tomorrow. And suppose we aren't poor, so don't hear me wrong. We're not, we've got to be careful how we read in some of these verses, but we're not poor. We're not the Apostle Paul who's been given this task at this moment. He was given that. However, we too have been given a very similar task. And so I'm going to ask a question today. Are you willing to put it on the line? And we're going to have two things. Are you willing to put it on the line to relentlessly contend for the maturity of your brothers and sisters in this building this morning? Are you willing to put it on the line for their maturity? Paul loved contending for the gospel. He loved contending for these people because he loved them more than he loved his own creature comforts. I'm going to contend for you no matter what. I'll have sleepless nights. I will do this. No matter what it will cause to me, I'm going to see that I'll present you before Christ when Christ returns as mature in him. And I reckon we've been given something similar. Matthew chapter 28, go and make disciples of Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says, run the race with perseverance. The word run is the same as the word contend here. It's this idea that we have a race to run. So yeah, we're very, our mission is to make and grow disciples of Jesus. It's actually very, I've been very strategic in the wording there because we've got make and grow. Because often we think we're just here to make, see conversions. No, 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 no. Our job is actually to grow, to mature. Because see, we've, we've, we, we sometimes have bought this lie that we're all about saying a prayer, put your hand up, have a bit of emotional music, walk down the front and say yes to Jesus. The conversion is the thing that we should all be on about. But when you look at Paul's philosophy and his conviction for gospel ministry, you'll start to learn that it's far, far greater than that. He's actually about their maturity, about being made, being converted, being born again. And that, that, that's just a little glimpse, but there's this journey of maturity till Christ returns. See, often we think that we're running a race, it's a bit like a 100 metre marathon. It's quick, it's sharp, get people to say yes to Jesus. And then we can sit back because after 100 metres, a quick sprint, it's actually not that hard to sit down. Within five minutes, you're recovered. But when you run a 100-kilometer ultra marathon, it's a completely different story. And the journey of making and growing disciples is more like a 100-kilometer ultra marathon that we run. And check out, look, 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 it's, it's way more, isn't it? See, this passage, you've received the gospel, and it's, but it's way more than that. He wants them to go deeper into it. Look at verse 25 and 26 and 27. Like, you know, I'm a steward of this message that God's given me, and I've got to present it to you, right? They're already Christians. I've got to present it to you, the word of God in its fullness. 
the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but now it's right, it's unveiled, it's disclosed to the people of God. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ. Right? He's saying, I want to make known to you. Do you realize that Christ is in you? He's with you right now, whether you're here today, whether you're at the shopping center, or whether you're in your hospital, or whether you're at home, or whether you're in your... I want you to know the reality that, that you're so united to Christ that everything that Christ has is now yours. His righteousness is now yours. His life is now your life. His resurrection is now your resurrection. His whole in- in- inheritance of the whole cosmos is now yours because Christ is in you, the hope of glory. Now, what's this mystery? He, he talks about this mystery over and over again now. I do wonder whether these false teachers have sort of been coming in and saying to the church, we've got a special revelation for you guys. Now, we've got it, but you don't. We've got this mystery that that if you're just like us, we've been enlightened to have this special mystery that you don't. And I wonder if you ever found that in church life. When someone sort of, you know, sort of, they come to you and there's a little bit of sense of pride and eagerness about them and they, and they go, hmm. I've got something for you that you haven't found. I've got this special meaning of this text that, that, that if you're just like me, you could have this mystery. As if it's just something that you've got to be like them in their situation to find that out. I don't know, have you ever had that? But see, Paul's he's pretty clear. He's like, um, there's no mystery any longer. It's, it's, not, it's, it's actually unveiled to everyone. Like it's, it's available. Like this mystery has been made known. It's Christ. That's the mystery of God's plan of salvation through his son. That God is going to redeem a people for himself through his son who will be forgiven, redeemed and made right with him. It's, been, it's not some mystery that you have to go around looking for. It's in Jesus. Look to Jesus, he's saying. It isn't open for only those who've had a special experience or a moving moment. The mystery isn't an end time event. The mystery is a person, Jesus Christ. It's all out. And what does he give them the beauty and the gloriousness and the majesticness of who Jesus is, the gospel of Christ in the word of God? He gives it to them because he's about maturity. Look at verse 28. Here's the purpose. Do you notice that it says, so that? That's a purpose statement. Here's the reason. So that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. He's relentlessly contending for the maturity of the church. Maturity matters. Seeing people come to Christ is only a small bit of that, and it's the beginning of what we are called to do. We are never finished to that task. Sometimes people will say, you know, like in, in years of ministry, people will come up to you and they'll, they'll say to you about someone, hey, that person's really mature. They say, you should watch that person. There's someone who's very mature. Um, they show the attributes of maturity and you go, okay, that's, 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 that's good. And so what you do is you watch them. But over time, I've started to realize that sometimes what people mean by, oh, I've noticed maturity in that person is, it's more their Bible knowledge. It's more that they can quote a verse at any moment and they give it to you. That their maturity is based upon how much they know about God's word. It's in the sense that they're just, they can come up with a verse for you in that moment and they give it to you. Now, just remember the Pharisees knew the Bible back to front as well. And then you start to and then you, and you start to look over time and you think, hang on. That they, they appear mature, but they're not mature in Christ. They they have great morals, they have great living, they, they sort of appear to know the Bible, but but what does it mean to be mature in Christ? Well, later on in, in Colossians chapter four, it talks about Epaphras seeking their maturity and full, fully being assured. See, maturity is being fully assured of who Christ is. It's it's a sense of that you'll be unsettled by false teachers. It's a sense of maturity in Christ is that you have contentment in Christ, that your identity, that your value, that your worth is tied up in him, that you're not phased by the things that are going on around you in the world. There's a sense in which we grow to be more and more like Christ, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, self-control. It's, it's giving them Jesus so they become more like Jesus. What's at the heart of maturity? What's at the heart of how we mature? It's Jesus. And I reckon we get a little bit of a template here, a principle of how we mature people. 
I think it's a great template for us as you do ministry. And it's not an easy template. It's not a golden bullet that makes ministry easier. But he does three things. Did you notice in verse 28, there's actually three things he says. Have a look. He is the one we proclaim. Warning or admonishing. And thirdly, teaching everyone with all wisdom. So there's three things there. The first one is we proclaim. Now, what do we proclaim? He's very clear. We proclaim the Son and you proclaim Jesus. Pastors, leaders, churches, whether you're in kids or youth or, or life, our Victory Cafe or whether it's life groups, what are we to preach? What's to be at the center of our message? It's meant to be Jesus. If you go somewhere where you notice that the message never talks about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ or Jesus is not proclaimed, then how are people maturing? Christ is proclaimed. That's who we proclaim. We proclaim him. But here's a warning as well. Just because someone uses the word Jesus doesn't mean that they're proclaiming Jesus. They could actually be proclaiming a false Jesus. But that's why Paul, he wants to mature us so that we can pick when a false Jesus is being preached. A false gospel message. We proclaim the gospel from, end, from, the, from beginning to the end. We go deeper into it. But at the same time, not only do we proclaim Christ, did you notice we warn? We admonish. Now, this is a harder one, isn't it? Like, I don't know. It is hard to get a rebuke. It's hard to get a warning. But to be taught, you need to be warned. And what I, what's really helpful in this passage, you need to know, like, check the context. He's talking to the church. He's saying, among the believers, we are to proclaim Christ. And we are to admonish one another. And we are to teach everyone. That's the, he's talking about the church here. We warn, I, I don't like being rebuked. But I wonder, are we, are we a church? Are we going to be a church that has open hearts, soft hearts, ready to listen? Are you ready when someone admonishes us? Are you ready when someone says, you may be a little bit out of line here? Will you listen? Because the reality is there's two things will happen. Either you'll listen and take it on board or you'll fight against it. Either you'll be willing to take that information and that warning and you'll either be willing to take it away for the sake of your soul and your maturity in Christ or you'll take it away and you'll gossip in the church and tear the person down. I wonder, are you, ready to, like, are you willing to be admonished? Like it's, it's a beautiful thing to have that, to be admonished in Christ, to go, hey, you know what, I've just noticed that the last couple of weeks on your social media page that you've been posting some things that tell me that you're struggling with some stuff at the moment. Do you know, what, do you know that Jesus is the answer for that for you in that moment? That's admonishing, isn't it? Like, or, or that moment where someone says, I, I've noticed that you're just, you, you're just getting caught up in, in a world of anxiety and worry and concern about the state. Have you, have you just, remember last week's sermon? Christ is supreme. He has supremacy over all things. Or to, you know, as a parent, you're struggling with your children and, and, and growing them and discipling them and you're getting a bit angry and, and, and you're losing your temper with them and, and, and someone says, hey, I, I noticed you're losing your temper with your kids. You know, what's going on there? Where, where, where are you not trusting Jesus with your children? And we teach. We, we teach. Not only do we preach, not only do we warn, we teach. What do we teach? We teach wisdom. We teach knowledge. Not our view, not our sage-like understanding, but verse 3 gives us what we teach. In chapter 2, in Jesus are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. We teach that. I wonder, are you willing to put it all on the line? Are you willing to put it on the line to strenuously contend for each other? Are you willing to do that for their maturity? Are you willing to be spent for that? To present them before Jesus when Christ returns, saying, hey, I've invested in them for their sake. And I, I think this, this, this content, like, you know, putting it on the line, here, I think some of you know what it's like in a different situation. I think some of you, you know, some of you who are first generation here in Australia, you, you may know a bit of what Paul's sort of strenuously contending for here, of putting things on the line. You've, 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 you've given up your culture, you've given up your family, you've given up your job, you gave up your, your country, you gave up your culture and your understandings and, and things, and you brought all your family to Australia. You put everything on the line so that they could be have a different life, 
so that they could have a different future. And I think, I reckon, in a way, if you felt that, you're starting to feel what Paul's feeling for the church, putting it on the line for them. And why do we do that? Because we want to see each other mature in Christ. Now, you might be here today and you think, and you're not a Christian, you're not a follower of Jesus, and you're sitting like, oh boy, I came here to find out how good Christianity is, and it's like, boy, I've got to strenuously contend, and you just feel like, boy, that sounds, that's too much for me. Well, let me just, just, just assure you that this motivation for strenuously contending for each other doesn't come from religion, it doesn't come from a place where we're doing it to please God. It's not coming from a place where we want to work towards getting our salvation from God. No, no, this motivation comes from Jesus himself. The motivation to do this comes because we believe that Jesus put it all on the line for us. That he, in the Garden of Gethsemane, as he said to his father, he knew what was coming his way. He said, Father, take this cup from me. Take the wrath, and, 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 and if it's your will. But it was God's will for his son to go through it. And so Jesus went through it. That in a way that the Bible depicts that he sweat, it, 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 looked like blood, it looked like blood sweating from him. The anguish that he was whipped, he was beaten, he was nailed to a cross. That the darkness showed the darkness of him being separated from God. And, and it's that that motivates us. Because we've been forgiven, redeemed and reconciled and we are dearly loved because of what Christ has done on the cross. That he gave up his heavenly palace so that we could gain his heavenly palace. So the gospel is good news about what Christ has done. And that's what now transforms our lives to seek contending for the maturity of each other, to be more like the one who has rescued us. And so I want to ask the question, are you willing? Are you willing to put on the line to relentlessly contend for the maturity of each other? And then finally, are you willing to contend for the protection of our maturity? See, Paul here in this passage, he's, he's, he's writing to protect them to guard them so that they're not deceived. Look at verse 4. I'm, gonna, I'm telling you this. I'm telling you that all, treasure, that, all, that, that all this treasure of wisdom and understanding, that namely Christ is this mystery, I'm telling you all this so you're not deceived. I want to protect you. I want to guard you so that you know the real deal, that you know the real Jesus, not a fake Jesus, so that you won't be taken left and right by the new teachings that come along every couple of years, but to be certain about who Christ is. He wants to protect their maturity by giving them Jesus. As you heard earlier, I, we enjoy caravanning. And, and last year, when we were caravanning, having a couple of weeks off, we were up at Hastings Point. And at night time, about 5.30 at night, I often head down with one of the boys. We'll take the fishing rods and we'll just go down to the inlet, this little bridge, and we'll go fishing for flathead. But this day, I'm throwing these lures out in this little sand bank. There's this little hole that flows in. And I'm trying to get flathead. And I caught... Within, with every throw, I was pulling in these fish that are about this big, right? And I pulled them in and I thought, they look like tailor. So tailor's a species of fish or a model of fish, you know, like it's a tailor. And, and I thought, oh, this would be good to eat. And so they looked like tailor. I pulled three, four in. They looked like tailor. So what do you do? I do the right thing. I check the government guidelines on how big the fish has to be to catch. You know, go on. I looked, okay, it's a tailor. The book, it says it's meant to be this size. And it was like a couple of centimeters over. So I'm like, yippee. I gutted them. I scaled them. I took them home and we ate them for dinner. Like it felt right. It looked right. The gut told me they're tailor. They're the right thing to do. And I should eat them. Later that night, I thought, I'm just going to look up the photo of what a tailor looks like. And I thought, because you have this moment and you think, and you go, oh, cry, because I hope I haven't fed them poisonous fish. And I look at the photo going, hang on, there's a thing called a jewfish or a, a mulloway. And really, all you notice is there's a difference on the, there's only just a difference with the tail and a few fins. And so I thought they were tailor when they were actually mulloway. And for mull, mulloway, I've had to repent because mulloway have to be over 70 centimetres to catch. I took it home like this and we killed, you know, the, you know they're probably an endangered species and I'll oh, probably extinct them. <laughs> but that was that, like, see, it, it felt right. It looked right. I had the gut feeling thinking this was the right thing, but it wasn't the real deal. See, it wasn't until I really examined the photos of the real deal that I go, that's not a tailor, that's a mulloway. And Paul, right, you see what he's doing? He just, again and again, the Colossians are going to tell us, he's going, I want you to grow in your understanding of Jesus so that you're mature and that you're protected. 
He relentlessly contends for their protection. Why? Because in Christ are hidden all the treasures. Do you notice that? All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I suppose it's a good question to ask. If people were to walk into our youth group, or if they were to walk into our kids program, or Victory Cafe, if they were to walk in here on a Sunday, would they see that Christ is at the center? Like that, that's, that's who we proclaim, that's who we warn, that's who we, we admonish in Christ, that we, we teach Christ. Do they see that that's what, that what we're all about? Do we contend that the person next to you will just treasure Jesus as they're all in all? I, um, I love Indiana Jones. Um, I just, I just, I just I dream and have, I have those imaginations, you know, of wearing the hat, having the boots, carrying the guns and the whip and, and just ransacking, well, not, not, not ransacking archaeology sites because that's not what you're meant to do. Um, but, you know, like I just, I just pitch, like, I just, it's just this boy in me that goes, I, I just want to be like Indiana Jones. You know, and, and I, dream, I used to dream as a kid, you dream about it, you imagine it, riding horses and, and, and going into tombs and finding new tombs filled with treasure and jewellery and gold and being able to take it back you know to dream and imagine that i could have the goal more gold than i could ever have treasures that i could ever need you know have more jewelry that ali will ever want to have and and uh, you know to have the artifacts hanging up in my room that just look beautiful and make my place imaginable and i'm just happy and content like i just dream about that with any jones that fullness of life and what paul's saying here is that's in christ that picture of all the treasures and all the jewelry and all the wisdom and all the knowledge, it's, it's actually in Christ that you'll find that. Happiness, contentment, life itself, breath, wonder, beauty, all you could ever imagine is found in him. See, Paul doesn't want them to stop maturing. He doesn't want to stop them maturing by taking on these false teachers, the lessons or to slip away from the one who is, holds the universe together. Because see, if we're at Tooney, we, we, we are actually a church about maturity. We're about seeing people converted, finding Jesus, and we are on about maturing the people of God. It's a key thing that we're on about, to mature. We're not here to entertain. We're not here just to put on a, a great show for you so that you feel happy about it. No, no, we're actually here that you'll treasure Jesus and that you'll mature in him. And one of the ways, like a church our size, one of the key ways in which we want to grow and establish a culture of maturity is actually in our life group ministry. That's one of the ways that you can mature. But here's a reality. You will be tempted if you're in a life group. You'll be tempted after a busy day at work, a restless night, a long week in front. There will be temptations to just message your life group leader and say, hey, I'm not up for it tonight. There'll be that temptation to not join a life group because there are just so many other things that are on the line for you right now. Every night of the week, there's just something I've got to press into. It consumes my energy and my time. But see, for us, life group ministry, it's actually, life group is a place where your brothers and your sisters are contending for you. They're contending for your maturity. They're contending to proclaim, to teach, and to warn, and to have you treasure Jesus. Where, where they are willing to suffer a little bit because Christ suffered a lot so that you will be more like Jesus Christ on that day when he returns. Has anyone struggled for you? Has anyone strenuously and relentlessly contended so that you would know Christ and that you would mature in Christ? Do you contend for the church or do you contend for you? Do you contend for the person who's sitting next to you today who you may not even know their name, but do you contend for their maturity or do you, are you contending for your own agenda and needs? Do you come to church going, what can church do for me? Or do you come going, here, I'm going to serve you? Like, do, do you serve in ministry, whether it's kids or youth or Victory Cafe or wherever it might be? Are you, are you serving there with your own agenda, having your own plans and your own vision of what you want to see them happen to them that you think's best for their life? Or are you actually there to contend 
for their maturity to know Christ and to treasure Christ. So some of you may be right now waiting until you get your house mortgage paid down a little bit before you'll be committed to contend for the maturity of others. Some of you might be waiting to finish degrees, get through university, and then, then I will start to contend for the maturity of others. Some of you may be holding off going to Bible college because it is going to make you uncomfortable at home. It may mean you're not around home as much as you, you used to be. Some of you may be going, you know, I'll, I'll contend in church where I want to serve. You know, contending by cleaning the toilets and, and serving coffee, that's not for me. Being at the front's for me. See, be encouraged, church, that whether you're cleaning the toilets, whether you're mowing the lawn, whether you're serving coffee, whether you're on the welcoming ministry, whatever it is in church, we have structured it for a way in which all of us are relentlessly contending for our maturity. Right now, today, as you serve on a serving team, you're contending for the maturity of the church. And how do we do it? Do we, do we man up? Do we build resilience in a way that's macho and masculine? Well, I think the answer's in the text. In verse 29. It's not something we do because you've bought into a world of the, the, the masculinity that's being presented about, you know, you just got to bubble wrap yourself. You got to become resilient. You just got to be. If you just work really hard, that's no, no, no. The gospel centers that out of that. Or maybe on the other side, and it's sort of like I'm, I'm white collar, and well, I just can't see myself sort of doing that strenuous, continuous. Mold. No, no. The, the, did you notice the answer here for Paul? Is he? He says, "I do it in the energy Christ gives me." I contend because Christ has given me this energy. Now, that's freeing for us as a church. It's freeing for us if you're a young mum who's having sleepless nights to someone who's retired and has got heaps of hours. It's actually saying that in your situation and in your season and your health and all that, it's like Christ will give the energy that you need to do what you can do. Which means as you look around, some may do more than others in that set. Like, how cool is that? He says, I'm doing this with the energy that Christ has given me. It doesn't come out of a, a boastfulness where I'm better or I've done more. No, it comes because Christ is in him. The Spirit is in us. See, on that day when we stand before Jesus to judge, we'll be there to present each other mature in Christ. May we strenuously strive for that. What are you willing to put on the line to strenuously contend for the maturity of each other? What are you willing to put on the line to protect the maturity of each other? Great clarity today, great clarity today will give you great conviction for tomorrow. And I think the best way to close, I, I was thinking how to close this is, like, it, it just made me think of Paul in 2 Corinthians where he says, you know, like five times I've, I've received the 40 lashes. I've been beaten. I've spent a night in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been endangered from rivers, danger from bandits, danger from the fellow Jews, dangers from the Gentiles. I've labored, I've toiled, I've gone without sleep, I've known hunger, I've known thirst, I've been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face the daily pressure. Like Paul had this extra pressure that he was concerned for the health of the church, who is weak and I do not feel weak, who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn. And he just goes on and on, and you can just see this. this this nature in which he just pleads and he wants the church to mature in Christ. And he goes on, I can, I'm not boasting in my strength, but I'm boasting because it's in my weakness that Christ is being known. You know, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, this is Paul, God has given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord, take it from me. But he said, no, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness. Why? So that Christ's power may rest on me. That, in, that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. 
Let's pray. Father, we pray, Lord Jesus, mature us. Lord, may we get ready for that day when you will return, where we will delight in you. Give us full assurance of your love, your salvation, your righteousness, your resurrection. And Lord, help us to just to love one another so deeply that we want to contend for their spiritual condition, to contend for their maturity, to contend that they'll know Christ more and more. And we thank you for that. Amen.